And if the depositors don't flee, which was your point, that's, right? That's exactly the point I was getting at, is, uh, is that uh, the, all this argument is based on the idea that depositors are sticky, or uh, my less polite way to say, dumb. You know, Senator Langford had this tense exchange with, with Yellen. She took pains to say that they're not actually guaranteeing going forward any non-systematic banks. I cannot believe that Janet Yellen did that. So I don't know whether she has the authority to do that. But mm. in my view, if she didn't have to have the authority, she had to create that authority SAP. We live in a social media world where the response time is in a matter of minutes, not even days. The Fed has spread this narrative, oh, is, uh, is the first bank run on social media, so it's not our fault, it's the social media. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Randy Shu with Lohan Academy, uh, and I have the distinct pleasure today of speaking with Professor Luigi Zangales. Um, Professor Zangales is the Robert McCormack Distinguished Service Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance uh, at the University of Chicago. Um, he is also a former president of the American Finance Association, uh, as well as the director uh, of the Stigler Center, um, where he also hosts one of the most popular podcasts on economic and finance issues, uh, Capital Isn't. Um, and uh, Professor Zingales is a, I won't go through all the credentials since we don't have time, but he is a renowned expert in uh, issues of the economy, uh, corporations, uh, as well as uh, financial markets. Uh, he is the author of two books uh, that I know of, um, Saving Capitalism from Capitalists, and a capitalism uh, for the people, recapturing the lost genius of American prosperity. Uh, so, you know, given all the events that have happened in the last ten days, uh, we are especially glad to, you know, have Professor Zingales with us today to discuss them. Um, so, why don't I kind of get started by, um, you know, asking you, uh, you in your podcast, Capitalism? You actually recently hosted. Um, uh, 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 Douglas Diamond, uh, who is your colleague at U Chicago and well known for you know creating the central model how, how, for how we think of um, you know bank runs and crises, and was also the winner of the Nobel Prize last year, the Diamond uh, uh, um, Divic mm -hmm. model. Um, and so he seemed to kind of be sympathetic to this view that a lot of these issues, even though you can blame a lot of people, uh, come down to a macro issue, which is the Fed uh, kept interest rates too low for too long and then raised them very, very quickly. So what, what you know, walk us through your thoughts about um, you know, how we should think about this crisis and what precipitated it. First of all, thanks for having me here. Um, I think that the, the first important point that uh, Doug made in the podcast was that uh, this is not the typical diamond dividend bank run. In the sense, the type of uh, typical diamond dividend bank run is a run due to uh, illiquidity. So um, I don't know how much your uh, Asian uh, um, audience uh, has seen the movie uh, it's a Wonderful Life. It's a classic uh, at Christmas here. Uh, in that movie, there is a bank run, and uh, James Stewart explain uh, why it's bad to have a bank run and say, look, I have a lot of assets. The assets is the mortgages that I made to you, 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 and name the people in front of him. Uh, so if you all demand your money back now, I cannot give it to you because uh, is uh, in those mortgages. but." Uh, there is enough value there. You, you're, you're thinking of this place all wrong, as if I had the money back in a safe. I, the, the money's not here. Well, your money's in Joe's house. That's right next to yours. And in the Kennedy house, and Mrs. Maitland's house, and a hundred others. Okay, and so those are the destructive bank runs that uh, bring down an institution uh, when uh, there is a lot of value in it. Now, what uh, uh, Doug has not uh, uh, stressed, but I would like to stress is, that's the reason why we have the lender of last resort. So that's the reason why we have the Fed. The Fed is supposed to land exactly in those situations to avoid a liquidity crisis. Okay? 
And uh, what is interesting is this is not any liquidity crisis. This is a insolvency crisis, okay? Insolvency crisis, why? Because uh, the, uh, some banks, and SVB is one, uh, Silicon Valley Bank is one, has uh, invested in long-term bonds, lost a lot of money in long-term bonds, and uh, the value of is, uh, its uh, assets is less than the value of the liability. In fact, I think for SVB, they were at the cusp uh, in be between uh, where roughly the value of the assets was equal to the value of the liability. Okay, but that's the reason why the Fed could not intervene in good conscience by lending money, uh, because even lending money uh, will bring it down. Uh, now, you can blame the Fed for the interest rates, uh, blah, 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 et cetera. However, I think that the first cause was bad risk management by the bank. And the second cause is bad regulatory behavior by the Fed. Uh, the Fed should have, first of all, should have known, and this is, Doug was very clear about that, the, the Fed should have known that a lot of banks might find themselves into this situation. Uh, in a sense, uh, any economist worth uh, the name was worried about this possibility. Now, the Fed had the ability to monitor and the responsibility to monitor, so it was not only should be worried, should have done something about it. Uh, it looks like they did not. Uh, ironically, uh, the Tuesday, so the, the crisis happened on a Thursday of last week, or the previous of the last week. Uh, in, uh, uh, on the Tuesday, uh, Chairman Powell uh, spoke in front of the Senate, and uh, there was one question about uh, uh, the, the capitalization of banks, and he said uh, uh, the uh, the American banks are well capitalized. Uh, so he was completely sort of oblivious of what was coming two days later, which is a bit scary. Um, and uh, and I think that uh, that's something that uh, we should be very uh, conscious about because uh, I think that's a, a major failure of regulation. I mean, how, how much of this is, uh, you know, do we have to go to psychology, right, to uh, behavioral psychology to kind of understand this? Because, you know, when you talk about the insolvency problem, um, from my hedge fund friends who are not necessarily even bank analysts, they were certainly aware, maybe starting in November when Silvergate started having problems, and certainly by January, that many banks were technically insolvent. Um, I remember these um, spreadsheets being spread around. Um, you know, I, I used to work in um, sell-side finance, so I still have friends in the industry. Um, but obviously, there's this view that, well, it, it happens when it happens, right? Until it happens, um, you know, the, the bank is still running. And so, um, you know, I guess the, the the view is, you know, how how much of this is a behavioral psychology issue that no one wants to deal with the problem until the problem is upon us, right? Actually, I don't think you need to uh, resort to be, uh, behavioral psychology. This is where I, I think I was very lucky because, you know, when when you when you interview people, you don't know what you get, and uh, and I think that uh, in, in a podcast after. Doug Diamond, we interview uh, Eric Rosengreen, who was the chairman of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Boston for many, many years. And so he's a regulator. He knows the way regulators think. think. And uh, he was uh, very honest. And he said, basically, yeah, it was, as you said, technically insolvent. However, if you could uh, bring those assets to maturity, uh, they would not be insolvent. So, uh, so technically, they bought these long-term bonds uh, that uh, now they're worth a fraction of what they pay for. So they lost money if they were to realize the losses today. However, if they can hold on to those to maturity, and some of them are 20 years from now, yeah. so a long maturity. Uh, well, and if and the depositors don't flee, which is your point, that's, right? That's exactly the point I was getting at. Is, uh, is that uh, the, all this argument is based on the idea that depositors are sticky or 
uh, my less polite way to say done. Now, I might be yeah. one of those, so I, I don't insult people. It's true that people are kind of uh, lazy, especially when they don't put a lot of money into that. Uh, however, I think that uh, what caught the Fed by surprise is that we live in a different world than we used to, and depositors move faster. Now, Silicon Valley Bank might be the fastest one of all because uh, the depositors were all sophisticated in, uh, venture capitalists. However, we saw immediately after the, the failure of the Silicon Valley Bank an enormous amount of movement of deposits. So uh, the days in which uh, you need to see you needed to see a, a line in front of a bank to start running are way gone. We live in a world of social media. Uh, we live in a world in which uh, every time I listen to a podcast, somebody advertises better rates at a different institution. So I think that uh, uh, there is a massive uh, increase in the sensitivities of depositors to two things. Number one, to rates. And number two, of course, to, to run. And I want to make the distinction because uh, very often these two things are conflated. But uh, the first thing is, uh, if uh, the, the treasury is at uh, uh, 4% and my bank account yields uh, 20 basis points, at some point, people will start moving their money out. Uh, and not everybody. And of course, I need uh, some liquidity to pay. Uh, but uh, when uh, my um, uh, when the, the, the treasury were at uh, half a basis point, and uh, my uh, uh, deposits were yielding zero, I think that uh, the incentives to move around were pretty limited. But now mm -hmm. the incentives exist. So uh, people are moving around. And of course, if I am a healthy balance sheet, I can compete and start to increase rates. But if I don't have a, a healthy balance sheet, I cannot afford to increase rates because if I increase rates, I go bust anyway. So I have to bet that uh, my depositors don't notice, they stick around, they stick around for 20 years uh, of, of mistreatment. And if they stick around for 20 years of mistreatment, uh, I uh, am not uh, uh, in default. Now, probably if in these 20 years I get lucky and I get some capital gains or I can issue equity, then I, then I can survive e even uh, uh, better. But, but the point is, uh, if the depositors are not sensitive at all to interest rates, then the game these guys are playing uh, uh, pays off and uh, the banks are not uh, in default. Once they start moving, uh, then the banks uh, are getting into uh, a situation where they can't uh, survive. And then when people anticipate, then there is the run the last day. So uh, in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, you had a massive transfer in the two weeks before and then, of course, you had the 40 billion run in a day. Uh, so that, that, th those are the two, uh, two moments. Uh, but we have to realize that uh, both things are present. And unlike the traditional diamond deep big bank run, just lending money, uh, unless you lend money for 30 years, is not going to do it. Uh, so the, the facility that the Fed opened is a facility for a year uh, and is a facility at uh, a relatively competitive uh, uh, rate. So it's not gonna fix uh, the problem of insolvent banks. Uh, and that's the reason why we see still a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty out there because uh, uh, the injection of liquidity is not enough to solve the problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like, uh, first of all, if I, you know, take a lot of your writings from before, um, you know, about over 10 years ago, you actually wrote um, an article in Bloomberg uh, op-ed called How Political Clout Made Banks Too Big to Fail, where you actually talked about some of these problems, but obviously in a 2012 kind of context. So I, I take it that in an ideal world, you probably don't support uh, financial, you know, financial dominance or uh, government need to come in. Um, and give all these you know, explicit and implicit guarantees. Um, that said, you also in that article didn't seem to like growing uh, concentration uh, in, in the banking sector. Uh, I'll be honest, like if, if I were one, one of the depositors of one of these banks, or even at this point, 
a small bank, a third tier bank. Uh, you know, why wouldn't I have my money with a first tier bank, especially if I'm a corporate treasurer? You know, I, I, I'm probably going to be asked by my CEO this question, right? So, I mean, it seems to me that one of the risks is if we underestimate how quickly this equilibrium kind of breaks. Like we had the equilibrium before because of all these issues and, and maybe laziness is, is one of them. And now the equilibrium has kind of broken. No matter how big SVB really is, it's gotten in the news and now people are worried. So are we, you know, how big is the risk that we do see uh, much more concentration in the industry? And we start to see, you know, this Fed facility won't help any banks with their solvency. Um, it just prevents, you know, a, a liquidity crunch uh, destroying everyone's deposits. But will we see a slow motion, uh, you know, set of bank runs and then concentration? So I think that those are excellent questions. Let's distinguish the, the long term and the short term. I think in the short term, you're absolutely right. What happened created uh, a, uh, a big uh, problem uh, and we need to act now. In fact, my uh, ideal uh, uh, response would have been to ensure all uh, what I call transaction deposits. Yeah, uh, like they did in 2008, right? Yeah, uh, at all the banks, um, but then to penalize a bit the uh, the deposits above two hundred fifty thousand in the two failed banks, because uh, on one hand there is no reason why we should give uh, insurance without uh, uh, having pay a premium for insurance, because in the past uh, uh, the the deposits up to two hundred two hundred fifty they pay a premium for the insurance, and uh, and so they get the insurance uh, giving for free the insurance to the people above is a transfer of money to the more wealthy, uh, which is really unfair. Uh, so yes, we need to protect the stability of the system moving forward, but the past is the past. So there is no reason to make a gift. And so that, that's the part that I find is the chronic capitalist part of this intervention. Not the fact that the government intervened, but the fact that the government by intervening gave kind of a gift to the people uh, uh, in the past. So, so, so that, can that, I add a question to yeah, that? Yes. Um, sorry. Yeah. It, it almost seems to me that we we guaranteed the past, but when Langford, you know, Senator Langford had this tense exchange with, with Yellen, uh, she took pains to say, I can understand why she took pains to say that they're not actually guaranteeing going forward any non systematic banks. So it's almost I, like I, we're not yeah. really guaranteeing the future either. I cannot believe that Janet Yellen did that. I think that my only explanation, you know, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know whether she has the authority to do that. But mm -hmm. in my view, if she didn't have to have the authority, she had to create that authority SAP. Uh, because, uh, and, and honestly, if she doesn't have the authority, she doesn't have the authority for anybody. So I don't know how in the world she said what she said, because that's, that is chronic capitalist 101. In, in, in a sense, so we, uh, in the United States, uh, we claim we are a rule of law country where sort of uh, decisions are made by Congress and they're not uh, arbitrary. But Janet Yellen did exactly that. She basically said, I am in charge of deciding who survives and who doesn't. And by the way, if you, li if you like me and you are kind with me or you say, uh, you're more likely to survive. Uh, so this is like unbelievable. So this is just my impression that they probably don't have the authority to say they're backing up everyone, right? They're creating but that, these but that, facilities. But then why that... she said that uh, she's going to back some? If you don't have the authority to back anyone, you don't have the authority yeah. to back anyone. And uh, and yeah. honestly, the only interpretation is the authority comes if this is systemic. Uh, but then, I think that what this crisis show is that uh, to some extent anybody is systemic these days, because the part that uh, uh, maybe we economists are a bit slow to uh, incorporate because we like to, be, to work mostly with rational model is that uh, there is a fear contagion effect, okay? So if you see a bank run into uh, the, any bank, then you start to worry. 
Uh, mm -hmm. My wife never worries about anything financial, uh, but the other day she sent me an email saying, are we okay? Why? It's because uh, she heard on NPR that the bank was failing and uh, she heard a big thing and she started to panic. I think that that's a level of awareness that comes with uh, even a small bank. In a sense, uh, ironically, uh, you know, Italy faced a major banking crisis in the 1930s and was during the fascist era. Uh, so uh, during that period, news were not reported and they handled the crisis much better than most uh, democracies because they, they, the public was not aware of what was happening. So if you live in that world, it's easy to manage bank crisis. Uh, but we don't live in that world. Uh, not only we don't live in that world, we live in a social media world where the response time is in a matter of minutes, not even days. Okay, In the, in the old days, it took uh, a newspaper to print and people to read the newspaper to have an impact. Today, a tweet is enough to activate millions of people. I think that uh, uh, that's the part. But uh, I don't want in this way uh, absorb the Fed because the Fed has spread this narrative, oh, is, uh, is the first bank run on social media, so it's not our fault, it's the social media. Uh, I think that uh, uh, I see the, answer, the opposite is you are getting a pass in the past because people were slow. You should have figured out that the world has changed and change yourself. And the fact it didn't change is uh, exhibit A of uh, uh, your uh, deficiencies. In fact, I I'm writing a an op-ed uh, to ask for a presidential investigation on the Fed. Uh, you know, after the Challenger exploded in space, uh, President Reagan appointed a presidential uh, commission that was chaired by a guy called William Rogers, but uh, among its members had people like Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize in Physics, and had uh, uh, Neil Armstrong, the first human uh, to set foot on the moon, and uh, a bunch of uh, uh, very prominent uh, three-star generals of the Air Force and so on and so forth. And that commission did a fantastic job in pointing out the deficiencies even inside NASA. Initially, NASA said, oh, we're going to do an internal review. And you know, when you do an internal review, you're, you're guaranteed that the top of the organization is safe, right? Because no internal review in the world will finger point to the head of the organization that appointed the commission. Uh, that's uh, human nature. And so the Fed has started an internal review. Uh, but uh, I think it's time wasted because uh, uh, they're not going to go to the end of it. And even if the, by a strike of luck, I am wrong and they are right and they were going to find the cause, people will not believe it, right? Because... Uh, if you do an internal review, you know that uh, you don't have the freedom to say the truth. So whatever you say is not credible. And I think that uh, in a moment like this, we desperately need an authoritative Fed. And to recreate this authoritative Fed, we need to actually do a presidential investigation. Like the NASA, I, I think that the reason why the Challenger was so devastating is not only because, of course, uh, there were a, a number of people dying, but also because undermine uh, the uh, right pride that Americans had in NASA and in technology. This is, the Americans brought uh, the man to the moon uh, in, uh, with a very small number of casualties along the way. So the technology was really, really fantastic. Uh, and, uh, but as everything in life, I think they got... Uh, kind of lazy and less efficient over time. And NASA had really gotten inefficient at the time where the Challenger exploded. Um, and, uh, and the investigation uh, exposed that. And so I like the analogy because it is similar to the Fed today. The Fed has been uh, very powerful for a long period of time. And people believe that the Fed uh, makes no mistake as uh, and, uh, uh, and I think they've gotten a bit uh, complacent in, in this attitude. And so time has come to uh, make sure that uh, uh, the Fed is still an authority institutions because we need it. 
Yeah, if, if I read that report, um, uh, you know, and I was a huge fan of, you know, physicists like Feynman growing up, and I remember the conclusions about the political decisions that were made, um, especially by the higher ups, right? The, the higher ups tended to, to want to ignore the problem because obviously they had a vested interest um, in it. But sorry, going back to, um, you know, taking us back to the uh, kind of um, issue is um, on the mid-sized, small to mid-sized banks. Uh, first of all, I think your colleague um, and co-author, Professor Rajan, has was quoted in a Wall Street Journal piece today, just saying, uh, talking about the importance of small banks for um, community lending and that soft information. And then also to my point about the slow motion, you know, everyone's focused on what happened in the Slack channel that got everyone to leave SVB. But you know, nowadays small business owners are talking to themselves. Like like you you said, you know, your friends have seen th these articles. Everyone's looking at it. Um, and I, I think the Wall Street Journal also quoted someone, a uh, small business owner saying, you know, everyone's moving their money or has moved it. You know, we're talking to this WhatsApp group, right, of local yeah. business people and we're all moving our money. So how how risky do you think this is, is for the slow motion uh, bank run? I think it's very risky also because, as I said, it's not slow motion. It's actually fast motion. <laughs> yeah. And it seems, it seems that... Uh, uh, the authorities are still uh, moving at the pace of the 20th century when the mm. deposits are moving at the 21st century pace. And, and so that, that's a problem of a mismatch, which is very, very serious. Uh, and, and I think that uh, uh, it was a mistake for the, for the Fed and, and the government not to uh, announce a insurance of deposits above uh, the threshold for transaction deposits. Uh, and I think they will be forced to do it, uh, uh, and it's better sooner than later. And then the question is, okay, you do that temporarily, what do you do long term? And that's, uh, if you want, we can open that chapter, my baby is for another interview because it's a long chapter, but, but I think that uh, we should rethink banking from, uh, from the beginning. Uh, banking, as we know, is an institution that evolved over the century, but it was basically a 17th century institution. Uh, in a world that uh, I don't need to say is very, very different in the world today. And yeah. I think that uh, uh, banking, as we know, has mostly survived because of regulation. And we need to rethink uh, uh, from the start. And let me give you a little bit of a hint. Um, this is part of American history, but at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, there were not uh, treasury banknotes in the United States. The only banknotes were literally notes issued by bank. That's the reason why I call banknotes. And, uh, and uh, those banknotes uh, of the same uh, face value were worth uh, a different amount. So you had a $10 bill from a Philadelphia bank that was worth la less or more than a $10 bill from a Chicago bank and vice versa. And uh, why? Because of an issue of... Uh, you are not sure whether the bank was there to actually give you the gold at the time you could cash for gold, uh, give you the gold in case you need it. And as a result, everybody who traded everything from wheat to, to whatever, uh, you had to consult the exchange rate of banknotes. Okay? Uh, as you can imagine, this was not a way to promote commerce inside of the United States because you had a constant uh, exercise of going back and forth, blah, 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 et cetera. And so eventually the government decided, we're gonna print the money. Uh, we're gonna make it a, a, a monopoly of the, of the government. Only the government can print the money. Uh, but uh, there are two big advantages of that. Number one, you can trust that the dollar is a dollar if you have the cash, which now we give for granted, but in the past we didn't. Number two, what is called the senior age, of being able to issue those banknotes accrue to the taxpayers and not some random banks. And so my question is, why can't we move that into digital money? Why can't we have, uh, because today commerce does not happen with cash. Commerce happens with digital money. And why we cannot have the same idea for digital money uh, at a time where this is desperately needed. And today we have a system in which we're not safe and the uh, senior age of uh, being able to print digital money accrues to the banks. 
And if the banks were perfectly competitive, you say this is related to the public, but they're not. And so we waste a lot of money from the taxpayer point of view, and we have an efficient system. Yeah. Um, so, so that was actually uh, dovetailing into my sort of last set of questions was, you know, since we're a digital economy, um, you know, think tank, really want to focus on digital aspect, which is, um, you know, that's a good segue into that, which is how, uh, what do you think this evolves into? Because actually, funny enough, what you described with the U.S., you know, uh, back in the 19th century has been what's happening with stable coins, right? They, they are different values at different times. Uh, there's Uniswap. Obviously, back then, they didn't have something like Uniswap to swap them all algorithmically together. But anyway, do you think, when you say digital money, are you thinking like a CBDC? Or are absolutely. you thinking we should absolutely. actually... No, no, absolutely. Okay. I think that, uh, you know, even Milton Friedman thought that uh, everything should be private except money. And uh, he was a big supporter of a monopoly of the uh, government over the printing of money. And so I think that uh, uh, time has come for the CBDC to be open to uh, the public. And then we need to think about uh, what other steps we need to introduce to uh, make uh, lending possible and to make uh, uh, the system stable, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, I don't see why if we, if we as a taxpayers guarantee all these deposits, why we shouldn't get the proceeds from uh, 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 the benefits from uh, uh, being able to have them rather and let them banks appropriate them and squander that money, okay? That, that's a lot of money. So, so what, what does the banking system look like then, right? Because if, if our transaction accounts and at least a lot of the proposals for CBDCs in the near future have them be, um, you know, some transaction currency, right? Just like currency. Yeah. How, wh what does the banking sector look like then? Oh, I think it's very simple. The, the banking sector looks like uh, uh, some intermediaries that borrow. My, in my ideal world, they shouldn't be able to borrow on demand. They must borrow at least uh, uh, with a one-month horizon. So they borrow short term and they invest longer term, but they have some security in place, some uh, liquidity in place to uh, bridge the two. Uh, but uh, they don't take demand deposits and uh, they can offer uh, whatever rate they want uh, to attract uh, the customer. In a sense, think about some major peer-to-peer -peer lenders. Uh, they, they do exist today and uh, they don't have demand deposits they have uh, some uh, investments. And, uh, and so people will make the choice of saying, do I need some transaction money? Yes, I hold it uh, at the Fed at a very low rate, possibly zero, possibly negative in some situation, or do I invest uh, some of this money? Uh, and then I need to uh, match my own assets and liability and say, when do I need this? So uh, this month uh, payroll, should be at the Fed. Uh, next month, I don't know, but certainly uh, in three months, uh, if, I, if I am a, a startup and I, I invest uh, and raise money every year, uh, that money invested can be in different tranches of CDs uh, with different maturities because I don't expect to consume it all together, right? I, I have a sort of burn up rate and, uh, and the money that I'm going to consume in six months can be locked in in a six-month CD where I get a higher return um, and, uh, and I take some risk. But I know that uh, with some probability, I might lose that. And if I don't want to lose it, I invest in a six-month uh, uh, treasury uh, on my own. That's perfectly fine. Uh, but that's an investment. And the other is a transaction money. Uh, in the same way in which uh, we separated... Uh, uh, banknotes from the rest. We now need to separate digital money from the rest. Okay. So let's say this doesn't, or, or like, you know, this doesn't happen as aggressively as you, you want to propose. Uh, and we still have more or less the current system we have today. Do you think there's anything, you know, th there's a Simpsons quote about where Homer talks about beer, but it can be applied to technology, which is, uh, it is a source, but also the solution to all our problems. Mm -hmm. um, so, so do you think for technology, um, is there anything that going forward, you know, technology can somewhat help 
help with with this. Like I was talking with um, uh, Richard Holden the other day and saying that maybe, you know, all this AI might be able to help the fact that, you know, regulators don't, they often say they're overwhelmed, they don't have enough time. And then the second thing is AI is potentially pretty good at pattern recognition. And the third thing is you often hear, well, you know, a 20 person startup with a part-time treasurer doesn't have the ability to monitor what's going on with the bank. And I'm just thinking, are there technologies that can kind of help our system be safer? I think that uh, I'm, a, I'm sorry to say that when there's no political will, there's no technology that can fix it. I think okay. that this, it, this case is not a case of uh, some uh, uh, hidden fraud and people could not figure it out, okay? Yeah. This was uh, in the plain sight. In a sense, if you look at the FDIC uh, report, the FDIC report, and I read it twice because I couldn't believe my eyes, they say that there are $600 billion of losses inside the bank's balance sheets. Yeah, I okay? think he gave the speech like a week before. Yeah, so, so this, is, uh, this is very clear uh, to everybody. So you don't need AI to figure it out. They, they figure it out. The question is, again, they were hoping that uh, they could get away with that. And uh, all the incentives were in that direction. And uh, now they realize that they can't get away and they're caught with their pants down and they don't know what to do. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I don't think that technology could solve. And I'm sorry, even if I teach FinTech, I'm not in love with, uh, with stable coins because stable coins do create uh, some monitoring risk as well. Where did they put uh, yeah. their money? And it's just, I, to these days, I don't know why Tether is still uh, 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 floating. Uh, it to me is kind of a, uh, unbelievable because there is no guarantee that they have all the money deposits. They, they, there is not a good system of auditing, etc. Uh, but this is still trades apart. Oh, pretty close. Yeah, um, I mean, I think what one one kind of uh, like thought I had was that uh, this is probably going to cause more problems we're going into a political cycle as well with the election than people think. And it part of that is it's accentuated by the fact that the bank is called Silicon Valley Bank. If it was just called Omega Bank of, you know, Santa Clara or something, it may cause less problems. But I, I'm just thinking about a scenario where you start to have some small banks uh, be unviable and then people hear about in the news, their local banks closing, but Silicon Valley Bank, right, got, got this treatment the depositors got this treatment and the other thing is you know a lot of these people are either startups or vcs uh vc backed startups and um it's amazing how much up war they raised uh, the sky was falling when first of all the vc people are supposed to know finance right so they knew that they were going to get a haircut maybe but they weren't going to lose all their money and two it's an industry where they could lose all their money in an investment right 10 investments they lose all their money in a few of them right so, so that was kind of ironic that they were saying the sky was falling, but I just don't know how, like that may not play well um, going into 2024. And I'm not oh, sure people course, like of course. realize how that bad that a, works out. From a political point of view, <clears throat> I think that this is gonna be extremely contentious um, and uh, will uh, uh, fuel the fire, fire of, uh, of uh, Trump uh, because, uh, Clearly, this is a problem of the Democratic administration. The Silicon Valley Bank is mostly formed by Democrat donors. And so I think it's very easy to paint this as a kind of a democratic conspiracy. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so it sounds like, okay, so I guess to, to end, uh, we're probably not ending on a super optimistic note. Well, um, thank you so much, Professor Zangales, for sharing your, your insights. Um, really appreciate your time. My pleasure.